I was really struck by a story and analogy that you shared at the beginning around the dining room table. And I think um, if you would be kind enough to share, I think it would really help um, our audience sort of understand how the brain makes sense of what the real world is versus what the real world we would like it to be. And then when the two don't match. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I still have this very vivid memory of when that analogy dawned on me. I was literally sitting in a in a series of lectures, including some by some Nobel laureates in cognitive neuroscience, and I thought, "Oh, I I understand what's happening." Like this idea just popped into my head. So this is the idea. But in order for the analogy to make sense, you have to you have to go with me on a premise, and the premise is that your dining room table has been stolen. So it doesn't really matter why your dining room table has been stolen. But so, so you wake up one night in the middle of the night and you realize that you're thirsty and you think, well, I'll go to the kitchen, get a glass of water. And so you walk down the hallway, you know, it's all dark in the house and, and you turn to, to cross the dining room to get, to go into the kitchen. And just as you walk through where the dining room table, just as your hip should hit the dining room table, you sort of feel this vacuum, right? You feel the, that it's not there. And that's very hard for a neuroscientist to explain, right? Because it should be sensation that makes us realize something is there, but not that we should feel the hole where something should be. But of course, you know, as I say in the book, as I've said before, the reason is that you're not actually walking through the real world. This is why you can walk around when it's practically dark in your house. You know, you're not actually using all those cues from your senses. We're walking all the time in this world that our, this virtual world that our brain constructs, that our mind that lives in our mind. And so we, we know where the dining room table will be. We expect that things that are there should be there. And when the real world and our internal expectation of the world, our internal map, our Google map, when the world and the map don't match up, it causes real distress. What, what, is, what is happening? We really do feel that. And you just think about the number of times that a grieving person walks into a room where their loved one should be, you know, <laughs> and, and we as grieving people are so aware of it. You know, you, you, you sit down at the Christmas dinner table or you, you walk into your, you know, you walk, you walk into the house at five o'clock when, when you and your partner should be returning home. All of those moments are conflict between what should be and what is. And the brain takes a very long time to learn the new reality that you're living in. But, so I, the, the analogy, when you say, I actually closed my eyes and I could think about it. Um, yeah. Like the expectation sometimes, I think sometimes I've, I can't, I can't think of, of a time, but I'm sure at some point I've gone to put something there and then like, yeah. it's not there. And you're like, oh. Yeah. But I guess in a way, if you can learn something, there is always a way to unlearn it and vice versa, which is actually a really yes. helpful thing. The brain is an incredible tool to in, in in as much as it's in its capacity to learn so there must be a way to unlearn it and I guess in my own mental health journey I've often been fascinated by my own brain as to some of my ingrained habits and how I can learn to unravel them but yeah yeah, yeah so I think you know what's interesting is the brain is there to help you learn and you will right so I actually think I think of grieving as a form of learning we have to understand, well, what is the world like now? But what's so interesting is I think that one of the funny things about the brain is there's something actively getting in the way of you learning this, right? So this is a, an example that might make sense to you. Um, so when I teach, right, for example, I teach the same course every fall, I teach a psychology of death and loss course, and I often teach it in the same lecture hall and, you know, the students sit in the same place, you know, through the semester and, and by the end of the semester, I know the students pretty well, I know some of their stories and their personalities and, and when I walk, when the class ends and then I go back to the lecture hall the following fall, 
and I walk in, I never expect to see those same students in those seats, right? Like, it is one trial learning. I, no one, never have I thought, oh gosh, I was expecting to see, you know, so and so <laughs> there. So if the brain can learn that so instantaneously, then what is the problem in grieving? And I think that the problem is when we have an attachment relationship, when we're bonded, with another person, with our one and only, you know, child or spouse or best friend or whoever it is, that attachment is encoded in the brain with this implicit belief. You will always be there for me. I will always be there for you. And what it means is even when we're not in the room with that person, we still know that they're out there for us, right? And so that belief, that implicit subconscious belief gets in the way of the new learning that they're not actually there. I mean, I love my students, but I am not attached to them in that way, right? And so that attachment neurobiology, I think actually prevents us from learning for a while. And that's why we do things like, you know, how many of us have picked up the phone to text our loved one and then realized, oh, wait, I can't do that anymore. And then thought, of course, have I lost my mind? But you haven't lost your mind. It's that you're, you're still on a learning curve. Part of your, you know, one stream of information in your brain knows the reality. And another stream of information in your brain has this implicit belief that they're out there. And those two can't both be true. And so you go through that grief over and over again as the, as those two conflicting beliefs sort of butt up against each other. But eventually our brain does learn. It, it learns to predict, oh, wait, no, this, this, this is not a person that I'm going to see again. I'm not going to, to hug them again. It doesn't mean I don't have all those brilliant memories and it doesn't mean I can't call them to mind and even have a conversation with them, but I no longer expect them when I walk into a room. Grief can and does feel like a heavy, oppressive sadness at times. But if we could learn to sit with it, let it move through us so that it doesn't stick to us, then perhaps we could even be given an opportunity to view loss in a new way and to build a meaningful life without what we once had. Dr Mary Francis has helped me to understand the difference between grief and grieving and why grief can leave you feeling as though your heart and head are disconnected. But she has also helped me to realise that they can work together and heal in their own way. And in time, they can once again work in unity. I hope this conversation may help you to feel less alone in your experience and to know that there is no right or wrong way to process loss. Your feelings are yours to own and to treasure along with your memories. But also know that with an ending, there is always a possibility of a new beginning. I'm someone who finds immense comfort in hearing other people's stories and experiences. But I also, at times, find it helpful to look at them from a more clinical perspective. So speaking to Judy and Mary Francis has helped me so much, not only in my understanding of grief, but also in how to turn loss into something I had never imagined it could be. Something full of love. I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Flip It. And if you did, I'd be hugely grateful if you could rate, review and subscribe. It will help me to discover and share more stories and voices that deserve to be heard. And check out the links in the show notes where you can share your own journal entry and also join the Flip It community by subscribing to our newsletter.